Well, the grace of God is absolutely free. And it will also cost you everything. And balancing this out is a trick. As we hear in today's question from a young preacher named Ryan, a leader who listens to the podcast, Ryan writes in, Pastor John says this, Hello, Pastor John, I'm stumped as to how to preach two truths. One, people cannot work to be saved. Christ did all the work for them, and now they must trust in him. Number two, I want them to realize following Jesus is costly and not an easy path of self-indulgence. Can you give me any helps for explaining that Christ is both free, as Isaiah 55, 1 says, and will also cost us everything, like the treasure in the field in Matthew 13, 44? Pastor John, what would you say to Ryan? I very much enjoyed thinking about this question, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm eager to, to say what I've been thinking because I, th- I think it sheds a lot of light on the nature of salvation. Uh, so here's what I need to do. To, to ma- just to make things more precise, I'm going to rephrase the question, um, and, and you'll see why. When Ryan says Christ is free and yet costs everything, the word Christ there is shorthand, I think, for enjoying God through Christ as our all-satisfying friend forever. Enjoying God through Christ as our all-satisfying friend forever. That That's what we get when we get Christ. That's what Christ offers to say you get Christ or you come to Christ. That's what you come to. You come to God through Christ and find your all-satisfying friend forever. So the paradox that Ryan is concerned about would go like this. Enjoying God through Christ as our all-satisfying friend forever is free and costs you everything. Now, with that paraphrase, I think we can explain the the paradox. There are two massive obstacles that have to be overcome before I can enjoy God through Christ as my all-satisfying friend forever. The first obstacle is called legal. It's a legal one, namely that God outside of Christ is not my friend. He's my enemy, holy, just, righteous judge who sees me as a guilty sinner. That is the main obstacle that has to be overcome. God's just and holy wrath. He's not my friend. If I get brought into his presence, I get incinerated. I don't get happy. The second obstacle we could call emotional or moral. First one's legal. This one is emotional. Namely, I don't find God all satisfying. Thank you very much. I don't see him as beautiful or supremely desirable in my natural state. In fact, I prefer other things for my satisfaction. I have exchanged the glory of God for images and other things. Those are the two obstacles that have to be overcome if I'm going to enjoy God through Christ as my all satisfying friend forever. Overcoming one would make him my friend. Overcoming the other would make him all satisfying. And maybe you can see now where this is leading. God takes the initiative to overcome both of these obstacles so that we can enjoy him through Christ as an all satisfying friend forever. And he does it first by the work of justification and second by the work of sanctification. In justification, God pays the debt of our sin through the blood of Christ and cancels our guilt and satisfies his holy wrath against sin and imputes to us the righteousness of Christ so that now God is totally for us, totally merciful to us. He is our friend forever. You can see it in texts like Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse. So the curse of God landed on Jesus and not on us. Or Isaiah 53.5. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. So the, the crushing of God's just penal wrath fell on 
Jesus so that it it doesn't fall on us. Or Romans 8, 3, God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He, keywords, condemned sin in the flesh. Our sin condemned in Jesus' flesh. So there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God is for us forever. He is our friend and our father and our protector and our provider. Everything from now on will work for our good. So the first obstacle is removed to enjoying God through Christ as our all-satisfying friend forever. He is our friend forever because of what Christ achieved for his elect. That is what Jesus bought. Now, what about the second obstacle? The natural mind is hostile to God. He may have overcome his hostility toward us on the cross, but what about ours? The natural mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. It cannot. Romans 8, 7. We have exchanged the glory of God for other things. We do not by nature enjoy God. We enjoy his gifts, not him. So if we are to enjoy God through Christ as our all-satisfying friend forever, God is going to have to do a second great, miraculous, redeeming work. He will have to take out of us the heart of stone that hates God and put into us the heart of flesh that loves God, delights in God, is satisfied in God, treasures God above all things. He's going to have to radically change our emotions and our moral preferences. And that's precisely what he promised to do in the new covenant, Ezekiel 11, Ezekiel 36, uh, Jeremiah 31, and this new covenant of taking out the heart of stone, putting in the heart of flesh, causing us to, to have new affections for God, Jesus bought that when he shed his blood, according to Luke twenty two twenty. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. So God moves in by his spirit. Once he has died for us, he moves in by his spirit, lays hold on us, and causes us to be born again, to believe, and he takes out the heart of stone. He puts in the heart of of flesh. He opens our eyes to see the beauty of God in Christ as more desirable than anything in the world, and he overcomes this second obstacle, namely our preference for other things in the hardness of our heart. So now, we got justification making us friends with God forever by removing his enmity and his wrath and justice. And we've got sanctification, taking out the heart of heart of stone and, and making us find him all satisfying forever. How does that resolve Ryan's perceived contradiction or paradox? The treasure of having God as our friend, not our enemy, and of having him as all-satisfying rather than boring. That treasure, the all-satisfying friendship of God in Christ forever, is totally free, bought for us by the blood of Christ. No one can buy the friendship of God. No one can buy a new heart that delights in God. You can't buy it. It has been bought by the blood of Jesus. It is free for the having. It's free, more specifically, it is free for the enjoying, which simply means that to be saved, that is, to enjoy God through Christ as my all-satisfying friend, I have to enjoy him above all things. Not less than than food or sex or family or fame, not equal with them. I have to enjoy him above those things. He has to be that sweet and precious. He has to be my treasure. If I don't enjoy him, he will not be all satisfying to me. And that is all Jesus meant when he said Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, an all-satisfying treasure, which a man found, covered up, and then, here's the key phrase, 
in his joy, he now finds this treasure supremely satisfying. In his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. The point of that parable is not that we pay for what Jesus already paid for. The point of that parable is that we now prefer the kingdom over everything in this world. And because we do, and because he gave his life as a ransom for us, we now will enjoy God through Christ as our all-satisfying friend forever. That is gold on the affections. Pastor John, thank you. And Ryan, thank you for the question. We always appreciate questions coming in from leaders. And uh, we get to three of those questions a week, so we can't get to a lot of them. But please continue to send your questions to us. We publish three times a week. And you can subscribe to our audio feeds and search our episode archive and even reach us by email with a leadership question that you may be facing in your ministry. You can do all of that through our online home at desiringgod.org forward slash Ask Pastor John. Well, we have a question from a listener, and uh, they want to know if the wedding date is set for a couple, is physical intimacy now permissible? Why or why not? Pastor John is going to make his case from Scripture, and that's how we will start next week. I am your host, Tony Ranke, and we will see you on Monday.